century was all too often the story of valor and violence seen through a hot haze of dust and gun smoke. But there was also another story, the story of a man whose deeds have largely gone unsung, though nonetheless heroic. A man who rode quietly in the vanguard of advancing civilization. Rex Allen stars as the Frontier Doctor. <laughs> Just in time, Doc. Here's your ticket. Thanks, Ed. I uh, hear you're going to a medical convention in San Francisco, is that right? <laughs> News gets around, don't it? <laughs> well, in Rising Springs, it sure does, Doc. Hey, what about my missus, Doc? What, what if the baby should come while you're gone? Telegraph Dr. Seeley over in Elkton. That's better than 50 miles away. He won't mind. I've done the same for him. Oh, but gee, Doc, what if... I'm here, here. Stop your worry. What's this? Pills? Oh, gumdrops. Oh, gumdrops? Finest thing in the world for expectant fathers. Now, when you get to worrying, just pop one of those in your mouth and start chewing on it. Worries will vanish. Just like that. Here she comes. See if the doc gets a train to Emerson, Joe. He's got a through ticket to San Francisco. Be good, doc. Take her away, Joe. We'll be looking at each other for quite a spell, so we might as well get acquainted. I'm Warren Scott, and this is Mrs. Scott. I'm Dr. Baxter. Nice to know you. A pleasure. I take it you've just been paying a visit to your old hometown. Is that right? Well, not exactly. You see, Rising Springs is my hometown. I've been practicing there for about a year. You don't say. Well, how in the world can you possibly earn a living out here in the middle of nowhere? This little town's hardly more than a bump on the road. <laughs> this little bump on the road, as you call it, Mr. Scott, happens to be the hub of a hundred-mile radius, which takes in an Indian reservation, an army post, and a ranch in population big enough to fill a city the size of St. Louis. What's more, these people are rough and hard living. Besides catching cold or whatever else you two might get, they get thrown off of their horses and trampled with their livestock and occasionally shoot one another. And they all depend on me to patch them up. Does that give you folks a rough idea or should I go on? Say no more, Doctor. You've made your point. <laughs> I'm already convinced you have the finest practice in the whole country, Dr. Baxter. That's exactly the way I feel. <laughs> As we moved on toward the railroad junction at Emerson, I learned that Mr. Scott was a prominent San Francisco attorney and that he'd been on a combined business and pleasure trip to Arizona where his firm had a managing interest in some mining properties. Feel all right, dear? No, tired, mostly. It won't be much longer. As soon as we get across the ridge, we'll be in Emerson. He means what he says. We better get out.
that. first aid. Go up on the road and stop the first wagon that comes by. I'll go back and check on the driver. Darling. Do what he says, dear. I'm all right. Emerson was little more than a railroad junction with no doctor and no medical facilities of any kind. Although the stage driver was dead, Mr. Scott needed surgery. So I advised him to continue to San Francisco where he would find the proper facilities. Mrs. Scott wired her husband's business partner to reserve accommodations for him at the Samaritan Hospital. After seeing Mr. Scott safely to the hospital, I was surprised but pleased that he insisted I continue on the case. I have no objection to Dr. Baxter performing the operation. It's simply that we have the finest staff in the city. Specialists in every... Bill Baxter's seen me through this far, Dr. Breen, and he's done a fine job. I have the utmost confidence in him. I want him to do whatever he wants to do. Understand? It's entirely for you to decide, Mr. Scott. I shall say no more. Doctor, if you will come with me, anything you need will be at your disposal. Thank you, Doctor. Warren, you don't know what a shock it was to get that telegram. Thank heavens you're all right, Eva. These are for Warren. Thank you. Well, I just couldn't imagine. Then I read about it in the papers. <laughs> it's fantastic, a stage holdup and being shot at. Uh, well, where'd you get hit, Warren? Try. Hurt much? I know the slug's there. Well, uh, who's performing the operation, Dr. Breen? No. The young man who was with us at the time of the accident. Dr. Bill Baxter. I don't know him, but uh, then I don't move about in such dignified social circles. I dare say not. Aren't they lovely? Thanks, Earl. Why don't you see if you can't get something nice to put them in, huh, dear? Of course, darling. Suppose now you know all about it. Yes, I know all about it. Oh, but why, Phil? Why? If you needed money that badly, we could have made some arrangement. Not the amount I needed. In the world did you ever get in so deep? You know how it is. You double your bet just to try and break even. Then you lose that. Then you steal from your own company. My company. And we lose our silver mine. If we're not careful, our law practice. Oh, if only... Oh, what's the use? I'd like to say I'd try and make it up, but we both know that's impossible. When I took you into the firm, I felt you'd be a social asset. That some of the finest names in the city would become our clients. I could have excused stupidity, laziness, anything but dishonesty. Or what do you want me to do, cut my throat? Yours or mine wouldn't make much difference now, would it? All right. Just what do you intend to do? I haven't decided yet. But one way or the other, you'll pay.
get out. Get out, you're starting to make me feel sick. client waiting at the office. The nurse is arranging the flowers. Eva. Oh, please, Phil. I thought we had an understanding. Sure, sure, we have. I just want you to know that if anything happens, that... Everything's all set, Mrs. Scott. We operate in about an hour. I'm Dr. Baxter. Uh, are you Mr. Scott's partner? Yes, Phil Tyler. But tell me, doctor, is everything going to be all right with Mr. Scott? Can't think of any reason why not. I've checked him over thoroughly, and he's in good health. The bullet lodged in an awkward spot, though. It entered the thigh, then ranged upward toward the pelvis. Luckily, it stopped short of the abdominal wall, so there's little danger of blood poisoning or hemorrhaging. Well, there, you see? No need to worry, is there? I'm not. He seems to be much more concerned than I am. <laughs> Excuse me. See you later. Yes. Well, will you uh, walk me to the door? Sound asleep all night. I was worried. He's been so sick all evening. He had ethers and anesthetic. Nausea always follows. Does it last long? Oh, by morning he'll be hungry as a lumberjack. May I see you home? Thank you. Dr. Breen, how's our patient? Your patient, Dr. Baxter, is dead. But Mrs. Scott, I... We're terribly sorry. But I want you to know that this hospital is entirely blameless. We cannot be responsible for the work of unknown doctors who come to us without recommendation. He was in top condition. I checked him before and after the operation. You did the best you could, doctor. It so happens it just wasn't good enough. But a general practitioner with your experience and background... Why don't you come right out and say it? A small-time doctor from the range, isn't that what you mean? There's no point in getting emotional. Tell me, what do you think caused his death? A coronary condition, obviously. Why, obviously, how could you be sure without an autopsy? If not a heart attack, then, doctor, what is your diagnosis? Did you notice those two bruises on his chest? Yes, but I see no significance. Those bruises were not there when I checked him just before midnight. They were inflicted between then and now. Inflicted? Dr. Baxter, are you suggesting that Mr. Scott was murdered? I'm suggesting that they could have been caused during a struggle. Look, Doctor, why go to such absurd lengths to cover a blunder? Officially, this will be written off as a coronary occlusion, induced by shock and anesthesia. It's not necessary for you to be further involved. I want to know what killed him. I've got to have an autopsy. I'll tell you what, Doctor. Since you seem so determined about this, I'll recommend an autopsy on one condition. If the findings go against you, you take public blame. I'll take what I honestly deserve. Very well. The autopsy proved that Warren Scott did not die of a heart condition, but was definitely murdered, and the police took over. Because Mr. Scott was my patient, I was a material witness, and it also fell to me to break the news to his widow. Well, it's my theory that sometime between midnight and dawn of April 12th, someone got into his room and smothered him with the bedclothes. Oh, poor Warren. 
Well, besides sounding highly improbable, I think it in extremely bad taste, particularly at this please, time. Please, Phil, the doctor knows what he's talking about. Believe me, I wouldn't distress Mrs. Scott if I didn't think it absolutely necessary. I fail to see that it is necessary, Doctor. Look, if Mr. Scott had enemies who felt strongly enough about it to kill him, they might also feel the same way about you or Mrs. Scott. Was he ever threatened? Warren handled criminal cases before I came with him. Uh, possibly one of those men, embittered and vengeful. I don't actually know of any such threats. Aren't you presuming a great deal, Doctor? No, because there's still the matter of that stagecoach holdup outside Emerson. Mr. Scott was deliberately shot when he got out of the coach. The robber didn't even wait to see if he had money on him or not. Why, that's true. This, uh, this man was masked, of course. Oh. You saw him then? Clearly. You could identify him? It was a face you'd never forget. And you, Eva? No, I didn't see him very clearly. <laughs> well, Doctor, I must say you're quite a bird dog. I'm sorry we weren't able to help you, but uh, well, I do wish you luck. Luck was with me that afternoon. A two-hour search of the police files turned up a picture of the man who held up the stage. He was known as Gino, a notorious waterfront assassin and hoodlum. The police were now combing the city in search of him. time to make your peace with God. By the evening, the police learned from Eva Scott's maid that she was dining with Philip Tyler at a popular cafe and gambling house called the Gaiety on Kearney off Market Street. right, Phil. There are people here who know us. Well, who cares what people think? You're supposed to sit home and grieve the rest of your life? I shouldn't have come out with you tonight. It hasn't even been a week. Look, I, I'm in love with you. Loved you for months. Waited for you. No, Phil, please. I'll do anything for you, Eva. Anything. Will you marry me? If you really loved me, Phil, you wouldn't ask me that now. Not yet. Sergeant Tucker from the San Francisco police. Yeah? A professional assassin known as Gino died an hour ago. He confessed to the killing of Warren Scott. Well, I must say that was quick work, Doctor. You were almost quicker, Mr. Tyler, sending the murderer after me. Well, how's that? Before he died, Gino implicated you as the man who had hired him to kill Mr. Scott. You better come along, Mr. Tyler. You're wanted for questioning. Uh, no. Now, this is absurd. Warren and I were partners. This criminal, he's trying to frame me. I, I don't even know him. Eva, you don't think. Oh, it couldn't be. He was Warren's friend, my friend. He couldn't possibly do such a thing. 
It's a nice break. you for, for your insurance. I wanted to marry you for your insurance. Eva, you hear? Eva. Afterwards, like every other doctor in the Bay Area, I worked unceasingly until the crisis was over. I tell you, Jake, one of the roughest weeks I've ever known in my life. Aside from all the earthquake excitement, Doc, how'd it go? Pretty well. Guy heading our way, mighty in a hurry. He got back just in time. Jake, follow me. Maybe we can get the doc back to my place ahead of the baby. Come on. Hang on, doc. Yeah. 